true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Despite constitutional guarantees, American civil rights and liberties are constantly in danger of violation, whether by individuals, corporations, or government institutions. Regardless of whether personal prejudices or national security's concerns lie at the root of these violations, challenging them and holding wrongdoers accountable is imperative for the sake of the constitutional integrity and the preservation of the American way. Trial lawyers advocate for awareness, the truth, and a person's right to know. They believe that in the absence of the truth, all of us stand helpless to defend ourselves, our families, our health, and our way of life. Oftentimes, we don't think about or worry about or understand what is happening to another until it happens to us. Deceits have no boundaries. Disease doesn't recognize the color of our skin or our political party's affiliation. When it comes to cover-ups and false allegations by agencies of the state and the federal government, there is not a soul amongst us who does not have a cringing fear of their overwhelming awesome power. It is at these times that we need experienced and dedicated trial lawyers, the warriors in the courtroom, who are willing to battle for us tooth and nail in the halls of justice to protect our cherished way of life. When a person with disabilities, or anyone else for that matter, calls the police seeking assistance, they expect to receive help. Sadly, people with disabilities and their family members or friends do not always receive the help they expect. In fact, they may receive something that is quite the opposite. People who experience forms of developmental or mental disabilities are oftentimes doubly targeted by police violence due to high rates of poverty and homelessness. The brutal murder of a homeless man with schizophrenia in Fullerton, California presents what happens when homelessness, mental illness, and police brutality meet. Kelly Thomas was sleeping on the streets when he was murdered. He was approached by six police officers in July of 2011. When Kelly allegedly refused to comply with his arrest, two police officers held him down, while four more police officers took turns beating him with their batons and stunning him with tasers for eight minutes. The beating left Kelly comatose and disfigured. He died less than a week afterwards. This was what Kelly Thomas looked like just before he died. To be plain, very little information is collected on a national level concerning police injuring and killing of people with disabilities. The problem comes from a larger failure to gather information on a national basis about police injuring and killing civilians as a whole. Police departments either do not collect or are reluctant to collect this kind of information. Reports of police injuring and killing civilians are scattered and imprecise. All across this great nation of ours, we see horrific examples of some cops beating and mistreating persons with developmental or mental disabilities because the cops are not properly trained. More training and better awareness of the complexities of interacting with people with disabilities will help decrease and maybe eliminate these unspeakable crimes against societies less fortunate. In Maryland, Ethan Saylor died because police responded with rapid and unnecessary force to his disability. In San Diego, 21-year-old Antonio Martinez, who has Down syndrome, was walking to his parents' bakery around 8 p.m when he was stopped, pepper sprayed, and beaten by a San Diego Sheriff's deputy. In Los Angeles, an LA County Sheriff's deputy was caught on a cell phone camera 
throwing a punch in a girl's face. What makes it more outrageous is that it is obvious he hit a person with special needs that was struggling to break loose from the grip of the cop and a female deputy as they were trying to make her get off the bus. In Dayton, Ohio, a mentally disabled teen was harassed and abused by a police officer. In Washington, D.C., police assaulted a homeless man in a wheelchair. In Idaho, police arrested and handcuffed an eight-year-old autistic girl. In Hillsborough County, Florida, police were caught by their own surveillance cameras dumping a quadriplegic man from his wheelchair onto the ground. Apparently, they were trying to determine whether or not he actually needed the chair. These are just a few of the hundreds of daily examples improperly trained police officers perpetrate on those less fortunate than us. Americans want to feel safe. Should we continue to accept the argument that cops only occasionally overstep their boundaries and only when handling guilty criminals and never with us? Can we really expect them to investigate and prosecute themselves when faced with allegations of misconduct? Can we believe that they are acting for our own good? Too many innocent people are convicted. Too many are wrongfully executed. The cost has become too high for free people to bear. The Department of Justice has reported how deeply embedded police brutality is and why recent political rhetoric promising solutions barely scratches the surface. In this insider exclusive Justice in America Network TV special, our news team visits with Brian Dunn, managing partner at the Cochran Law Firm in Los Angeles, California, and Megan Jonchis, one of their key trial lawyers, to examine how they successfully represented the family of Nicholas Robertson to get justice. At approximately 11 a.m. on December 12, 2015, 27-year-old Nicholas Robertson was shot and killed by Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department deputies Richard Ochoa Garcia and Jason Tapia at an Arco gas station in Linwood, California. Over his 23-year career, Brian has resolved over 200 cases in state and federal court. And the majority of these cases involve police shootings that all too often lead to the death of the victim. No other attorney has better expertise in handling matters of police shootings and no other attorney is better equipped to help a jury understand the responsibilities of police officers, departments, and the law as it relates to a police officer's use of deadly force. Having spent his entire career with the Cochrane firm, he has handled many of the firm's highest profile police misconduct cases, including those involving Geronimo Pratt, Reginald Denny, Devin Brown, and Taisha Miller. Brian is driven to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Los Angeles, California. It is my great pleasure to introduce Brian Dunn and Megan Jonges to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us, Steve. Thank you, Steve. The Cochran Firm is famous in Los Angeles and across the country for doing a lot of police stories, you know, police cases, wrongful deaths, um, you know, excessive force. You, both of you, handle a lot of those cases, don't you? We do. And uh, it's one of, one of the interesting things, Steve, because this is something that we've been known for doing uh, because this is something that our founders started uh, as far back uh, as the 50s. Uh, Johnny Cochran uh, was one of the founding uh, lawyers uh, that actually had the courage uh, to take on cases uh, involving excessive force, uh, cases involving wrongful death uh, at the hands of police, 
this is something that's, that's considered to be uh, an accepted area of practice now, uh, but it's not something that has always been that way. Uh, these cases are very unique. Uh, they have political undertones. A lot of times you have situations in which uh, individuals have been killed uh, that were breaking the law. Uh, and we're dealing with uh, enforcing the Constitution uh, mm. on the most base level. And it involves also just a lot of uh, analysis and, and legal analysis involving, uh, for example, uh, whether or not uh, issues should come in regarding an in individual's criminal history, uh, whether or not issues should come in uh, involving the use of drugs, uh, whether or not uh, the officer's disciplinary is history uh, should be relevant. Uh, and in, in dealing with these issues, uh, we also have a lot of challenges from the juries. Absolutely. Sometimes in these cases, picking the jury is one of the most difficult things that uh, we have to do in our profession. What do you look for in a juror? We look for somebody who has an open-minded approach uh, to what can usually be some very troubling evidence on both sides. Uh, we want somebody ultimately who's going to evaluate everything in the case uh, and not approach, uh, not approach it with deference to the officer. Uh, in a way that would put the officer above, perhaps, you know, the plaintiff. We want an equal play playing field. That's what we seek, ultimately, from a juror. And it's always about people, Steve. That's the most important thing. Uh, we're dealing with mothers uh, who've lost their sons. Uh, we're dealing with wives who've lost their husbands. Uh, this is going to be the only uh, time they ever see something like this. Uh, we have many cases, uh, but this is going to be the only case for them. And when we look at what, what's happening, uh, we, we are constantly dealing with issues where uh, we're explaining to a jury uh, that uh, this person may have done this or they may have done that, but we don't have the death penalty for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the person does not deserve to die uh, for what happened because when we're talking about deadly force, which most of these cases involve, that's exactly what we're talking about, the power to kill. As a result of the lawsuits that you have successfully won against the police departments, do you see the police departments changing their conduct? That's another very good question, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, these cases make a very significant impact. Uh, this is really the only way uh, that a private citizen uh, can seek justice. Uh, it, it goes without saying that the district attorney's office is never going to prosecute uh, an officer involved in a deadly force situation criminally. That just doesn't happen. Uh, they almost never even have any repercussions professionally. Not going to lose their job. Uh, so what is, what is the recourse? Uh, what can a person do uh, when something like this happens? And the reality is, it's this type of civil case uh, that provides the only real avenue uh, for justice for these families. Um, today we're here to talk about a case where you represented the family of Nicholas Robertson. And would you tell our audience a little bit about what happened to Nicholas? Well, specifically, uh, the call uh, that originated uh, was a man with a gun call. Uh, Nicholas Robertson uh, had been doing some drugs uh, he had a gun uh, and uh, ostensibly while under the influence uh, of a narcotic that is known as PCP, he fired the, the gun into the air. This was in broad daylight, right? Yes, it was early, it was in the morning. It was, uh, it was around 11 o'clock a.m. on a yeah. Saturday in December. Yeah, so I mean, uh, what happened was the neighbors, of course, are going to call law enforcement. Uh, there's an individual, uh, they don't know what he's up to. Uh, he seems to be acting in an erratic fashion. Uh, and law enforcement uh, is going to typically uh, respond pretty aggressively to this type of situation. Uh, when they first encountered him, uh, he was uh, still in possession of the firearm. Uh, he was not responsive to their commands. Uh, they were talking to him. Uh, apparently, he wasn't uh, listening or responding in a manner uh, that they thought uh, that he should be. Uh, and uh, they got out of their vehicles, kind of closed the distance on him, and then the rest is really on video. Right. And as we were talking, we are watching this, and we see that the cops just unloaded their weapons on him, right? Absolutely. They fired 33 rounds between the two deputies who responded to the call. Yeah. 33 shots. You obviously, did you depose these deputies? Absolutely. Okay, what was their answer to the question? Why did you shoot him so many times? Well, that's a very interesting uh, question because they gave several different answers. Because in the video, as we just saw, 
you know, he's crawling on the ground. Well, they're still shooting him. And that's a great point, Stephen. I'll tell you why. Because when they yeah. gave their initial statements, yeah. they didn't know about the video. They didn't know the whole thing was captured on video. So they were saying that he was pointing a gun at us. Yeah. Uh, we were in fear for our lives and we, we were fighting self-defense. Which is a lie. Yes. I thought we were going to be shot. And these are L.A. County sheriffs, right? Yes. yes. Is that right? Okay, fine. So uh, then they see the video. And uh, the, the story changes a little bit in there. Uh, well, how does the story change? I lied. Here's what really happened. How does it change? No. If it were so easy. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 well, well, how do they account for the fact that it is a lie? Well, what happened, uh, what happened when the depositions were taken is that the justification for the shooting changed. Because yeah. once they saw the video, they realized that it was going to be very, very difficult for them to run with the story that, yeah. that Mr. Robertson posed a threat to them. And so then it took on an aspect of uh, we did this because we needed to protect the public. Uh, less so ourselves, more so the people in that area. Right. Uh, so instead of self-defense, it became defense of others. Uh, uh, but even that had some problems because... Uh, it, in looking at the video uh, and in slowing the video down, uh, you, it's very difficult to see any civilians uh, that are in there. Yeah, there was nobody there. Yeah, and ironically, Steve, uh, all of the bullets that were fired were fired by law enforcement, and, and they actually shot into uh, the gas tank uh, at the, at the, at the uh, Arco there. Uh, they shot up the wall. Uh, you had a lot of individuals that, that had their cars shot up in an adjacent uh, lot. Uh, so this is this is kind of a situation where, you know, they were saying that Mr. Robertson was a threat to public safety, and we understand that. Uh, but the reality was quite different. What were some of the challenges you had in this case when you're presenting it to the jury? One of the most difficult challenges, I think, was trying to limit what we call prejudicial evidence right. uh, about Mr. Robertson and about the circumstances leading up to it. One Meaning that he was he had he was on drugs. Yeah, that he was on drugs. That was a strategic decision we had to make. Um, you know, it was PCP, and there was a question: Do we want to try to keep this out, or is it something that we actually need in this case to s explain what was very erratic behavior? What was your decision? Ultimately, we decided that it would be better for the jury to understand everything that had happened that day and give them some explanation for why it was that Mr. Robertson was out there uh, and had done what he the did. The reason for the use of the drugs. And the other serious problem we had there was that he actually did have a firearm. Now, the gun wasn't loaded. It was not loaded. It was not loaded because when he fired the gun into the air, he had literally emptied the clip of the gun. Yeah. But, of course, uh, there's no way that we can say that the, the officers knew that the gun wasn't loaded. Sure. So you have this very serious issue. Uh, but one of the things that we're able to show is that if you look at any type of uh, police practices and any type of police standards, the mere possession of a firearm alone does not give the police the right to use deadly force. Uh, just holding a firearm uh, in the manner that he is holding it does not standing alone. Let me ask you this question, because we have often seen where someone's holding a weapon, could be a knife, could be a gun, right? Police tell that person to put it down, to drop it. They don't. And oftentimes you see the police officers shoot them after that. So I heard what you just said, it's that it isn't still... justification for shooting someone, but when they refuse a direct order by a police officer, is that justification? It's still not justification for using deadly force unless yeah. they're actually threatening someone with a gun. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of exactly what we had here. Uh, this man, as, as uh, Ms. John just correctly pointed out, he was under the influence uh, of narcotic. Now, all of these things are not sympathetic factors, uh, but we don't kill people for that, standing yeah. alone. He didn't serve to die. Should have had his day in court. Uh, but when they're asking him to drop the gun, and he's not dropping the gun, the question then becomes, is he threatening anyone with it? And if the gun is pointed down, and he's waving it around, and he's waving off the officers, which we can very clearly see uh, in the video, and they're saying drop it, and he's not dropping it, uh, just those facts alone do not give rise to the use of deadly force. Mm -hmm. So uh, the general public may think uh, that if a, man is, if a man is in possession of a firearm, police tell him to drop the firearm. He doesn't drop the firearm, then it's, uh, it's, all, over. And then it's all over. Yeah. That's the, the situation in terms of police training is more complicated. Right. Are police trained properly in these matters? Uh, yes. I mean, like, as a result of this lawsuit, did they retrain some of the officers? I, I think, uh, Steve, the, the issue is not whether they were trained properly, but whether they actually uh, did what they were trained to do okay. uh, when they were out in the field and when they were facing with uh, an unpredictable situation. What was the resolution of this case? Uh, we got a jury verdict, and the total gross verdict was $3.6 million. Uh, the jury awarded uh, money uh, only to his three surviving children. Mm -hmm. uh, his wife uh, received uh, nothing. Uh, his father received nothing, uh, and his mother received nothing. So a fund was set up for his children. Yes, exactly. A fund was set up for his children, but he was found uh, to be one-third at fault. Yeah. 
yes. uh, which reduced the award uh, by one third uh, to, I believe, 2.4 million. Who determines that, by the way, when you say he was found to be at fault, so it reduces the verdict? Does a judge do that, or what? Is that a separate hearing, or how does that work? It's actually part of the jury's verdict. Uh, it's actually part of the jury's verdict. When you have a negligence claim, which we had in this case, yeah. uh, there's a principle called comparative fault. And the right. jury will determine not only if the officers share some responsibility for what's happened to somebody, but also whether the person who was injured or killed shares some responsibility for their own injuries or their death. Just curious, how do they come up with one-third in this particular case? We'll never know. Um, you know. We're never allowed to know exactly what happens behind closed doors in the jury room. Okay, well, congratulations on winning that case. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So let's talk about um, some of the questions that a lot of people who are watching these shows have when they're dealing with the police. And one of them is you often hear people say, you know, he violated my civil rights. What's that mean exactly? Well, with the, a, a civil rights violation involves constitutional principles that are um, enshrined in the Fourth Amendment, which mm -hmm. protects against unreasonable searches and against unreasonable seizures. Right. When a police officer uses force against an individual, whether that's through physical force, the use of a taser, or a firearm, we call that a seizure for purposes of the Fourth Amendment. And that person can then sue in federal court for violations of their Fourth Amendment rights and to be free from that. And thank you very much. And, and that happens if they use excessive force. Yeah. And excessive force uh, will give rise to a civil rights violation. Now, you have a lot of people that call you because uh, you're well known to handle these kind of cases, and they will give their version of the facts. The police are going to have a record of their version of the facts. How do you discover the truth? Well, let me start by saying we take less than one-tenth of one percent, literally. Of all police cases. Of the people that call. Yeah. We take less than one-tenth of one percent mm -hmm. uh, because the vast majority of people that call, uh, we have to frankly uh, conclude that there's no case there uh, because the police either did everything right uh, or the facts just don't justify yeah, I think I, I think that's very important for you to say that because a lot of people think that lawyers are out there just suing the police department so they can get rich. I'm glad you brought up because I did not know this that you take one tenth less than one tenth of one percent. Yes. So there's a lot of people that say, "Hey, my rights were violated." You see them on TV all day long, right? But the bottom line is there is no case there, right? We did a study. We out of 800 calls, uh, we only asked two out of that 800 to come in for an interview, and we only took one wow. out of 800. <laughs> and, and one of the things you're looking at is, A, is this a good case? Can we win this case? Yes. Are the facts there? And another thing I want to bring up, which a lot of people don't know about your firm, is your firm takes cases on contingency. And contingency means for the audience that you, that person that you're going to represent does not have to put up any money at all while you prosecute the case. And it could be years before you get a verdict, and then it could be appealed too, right? Yes, it very frequently happens, yes. Yeah, so you're out the time and the money, but you do it because it's a good case. But it's, but it's also, uh, Steve, when you're dealing with uh, someone who's lost a loved one, mm -hmm. and you're sitting in their living room, and you're looking at pictures of the loved one, they're never interested in money. What, the thing that they're most interested in, the just, thing that they always say, well, just can you keep this from happening again? See, the true victim, the true face of suffering, uh, is not, it's not someone that's interested in money. They just want to know if there's anything that can be done to keep another family from going through this, to keep another mother from going through this. Yeah. And that really uh, motivates us uh, more than anything around here. For our audience, what exactly is police misconduct? What is excessive force? How do you define that? If you look at the letter of the law, okay. it is more force than necessary. But if you look at the actual functionality and the spirit of the law, right. it's is there an abuse of power that rises to the level that we think a jury would be outraged? That's really in the real world what it means. Um, when folks are evaluating law firms, they, ha they think they have a case. The name Johnny Cochran stands out in Los Angeles, stands out in America as one of the best trial lawyers and firms in this country. How do, what, what represents a law firm, what is a good law firm to take a case? 
First of all, you have to have been doing it for years. Yeah, you've got to uh, have the experience. Yeah, we've been doing this for, well, I've been at this firm for 25 years. Yeah. And this is what you we've You came here with. right out of law school. Right, right out of law school. I've been here 25 <laughs> years, half my life. I've been here. Yeah. Uh, you got to have the years. Uh, but you also, you have to be able to produce results. And it, the fact of the matter is, a lot of lawyers think they can do these cases. Yeah. And a lot of lawyers see it and, they, and they, they get these cases and they wind up getting defensed. And we win the majority of our cases in trial. Uh, in the last... Uh, uh, three years, uh, we have won, I believe, seven out of out of nine. And, uh, this and you've is, tried what over two hundred cases, something like that. No, I've taken over two hundred. In terms yeah. of actual cases that go to trial, yeah. it's around fifty. Yeah, it's in that range. What is what what what? And these are mainly police cases, right? The majority. Yes, so the majority. out of the two hundred cases, one hundred and fifty settled. Why? Well, there's <laughs> there's a million reasons why yeah. cases settle. Uh, is, it, is it because of the conduct is so blatant and egregious? No, it's simply because it's a business decision on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't ever admit fault, right. and they will never admit that they did anything wrong. Uh, essentially, it'll settle because uh, the individuals that are responsible for paying the money uh, have concluded that it is wiser to pay this now uh, than to risk uh, something else that could happen at trial. And the people that are possibly receiving the money uh, believe that it is a better business decision uh, to have a situation where they can control rather than the unpredictable uh, results that can happen in trial. How has your law firm made a difference in the lives of your clients? Oh, there are, uh, there's a number of, of ways that that's happened in my experience working with Mr. Dunn so far. One of the most rewarding things I think that we've been able to do, whether it's through a verdict at trial or through a settlement, is to be able to get families' houses, is to be able to set up annuities for children that will ensure that they'll have a college education, that they'll have financial stability, in their early formative years and throughout the course of their lives. And to be able to use something like these cases to really change the dynamic of a family and to give especially children a future, I think is, is the most rewarding aspect of the job and one of the most important things that we do. Right. Both of you could practice any type of law. You could do insurance bad faith, you could do 18-wheeler cases or whatever, but yet you choose a very difficult practice because these cases are tough to win. They're tough to win. Why, both of you, why did you select this as your career, Brian? It just resonates with my soul. That's it. I, I wanted to make a difference. Uh, I've always had some uh, problems uh, with the way that uh, police have, have treated people. Uh, I believe that uh, I've seen a lot of personal examples of it. And uh, it's something that resonates uh, with who I am. I think this is one of the most serious issues that faces the country, uh, especially now. Uh, there's a lot of division in the country in general, uh, and especially when it comes to these issues. And I think being able to be on the side that I'm on uh, and to try to affect real change, not only in police departments, but for families, as we've, been, as we've been discussing, is something that's been a driving factor for me. Being able to see it in its ugly reality uh, has only made my feelings about that stronger. I want to thank both of you for being on the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.